to shattering this related story to what we were talking about, the fact that the Islamic scriptures and the Islamic behavior are in unison in being savage against women, against being violent against men. In a uh, clinic, a young fighter, this is a CNN story, asked uh, that we, uh, that CNN asked that, uh, asked CNN to conceal his name, of course, because in uh, Islam, which they don't mention here, if it is known that this person even talked with the media, they'd be killed. So he's going by the name of Ahmed. Three years ago, uh, before Syria's revolution, and it's really not a revolution, that's a, uh, would be an erroneous term, it is a proxy war. He uh, was uh, in high school. His quote is, when we reach the point where if we don't fight, we will get killed, it, fighting becomes the only option. And that really is the nature of Islam. Fighting is the only option. Ultimately, as we have been considering, Yahshua Isaiah 17 and 18, when Muslims flood uncontrollably, screaming Allah U Akbar into Israel. Now, I came up with a, a best estimate of 150 million Muslims. But a lot of that number is dependent upon the realization that if you are a Muslim in a Muslim-majority country, a male Muslim in a Muslim-majority country of fighting age, which in Islam could be anywhere from about 14 or 15 to about um, 35 or 40, and you don't go, good Muslims will kill you. Because the Quran says that you can't be a Muslim if you don't support jihad. And the Quran tells good Muslim jihadists to kill the Muslims who don't engage in jihad. So it's apparent that what he is, this one Muslim is saying is true. We reach a point that if we don't fight, we get killed. If you aren't willing to go and fight as a Muslim in an Islamic country, then Muslims on both sides will kill you. It's not just that you should look at this and say, you know, if this is a Sunni Muslim and, uh, and he's combating a Shiite regime, that if he doesn't fight on behalf of Sunnis, the Shia will kill him. But the fact is that if, he, if he's a Sunni Muslim, living in a Sunni Muslim community, and he doesn't fight, the Sunni Muslims will kill him. And they will do so under the authorization of their God, Allah, and their Quran. Ahmad tells us that one hand rubbing against the bandages, as one hand rubs against the bandages, if I do not fight for my country, then who is going to, was his next statement. But Fight for his country. What side is he on? Is he fighting for his country, which would be the Syrian government, or is he amongst those who are imported jihadists who are fighting against the Syrian government? I mean, which side is fighting for the country? I would dare say it's only the Shia that are fighting for the country. It's the Sunnis that are fighting against the country. It's not just a war with weapons. It's a war on our soul, our psyche, he says. It's all death. It is a war on every Muslim soul. Islam is a war on the souls of Muslims. And nothing could be truer than it is all death. Victims of Islam, when they die, and many die prematurely because they are mujahideen and jihadists. Death will be the end of it for them, be nothing more. Those who have been victimized by Islam. Those who promote Islam, like Ibrahim Hooper of the Council on American Islamic Relations, they will spend eternity paying for their great crime, for the perversity that they upheld for the merciless deeds that they enabled. They will spend an eternity being tormented by the very demonic spirit that they sought to worship as God. It is all death for the Muslim. There is no life. Muhammad and Allah 
were never able to give Muslims a reason to live, only a reason to die. Marcel finds himself at the crosshairs of the Syrian war, a Sunni enclave in Lebanon's Shia Becca Valley, Hezbollah's stronghold. Yeah, why go there? Hezbollah dispatched its fighters to battle uh, alongside the Assad, it says regime, why not call it government? It's hardened fighters allowing the Syrian government to reclaim key towns and territory close to the Lebanese border, checking off uh, supply lines for the rebels, sending masses streaming into Lebanon. You know, this is partially true, and part of it is extraordinarily important. Prior to the engagement of Hezbollah, which means Allah's party, these are Shia Muslims, they are in a Mujahideen, a group of holy warriors that is managed entirely and funded entirely and armed entirely out of Iran. They are Iran's special forces, Hezbollah. Prior to Hezbollah engaging on behalf of the Assad government, Assad was losing every battle. He was losing the proxy war. And I remember in the first two years of the war when Hezbollah was not engaged, and Hezbollah didn't engage for a reason. They want to use their weapons and their trainings to destroy Israel. That's why they exist. They exist specifically to attack and destroy Israel. And so long as they thought the Assad government could maintain its control, there was no reason for them to waste their bullets and their suicide bombers and their jihadists on fellow Muslims. But when Assad started to lose, Hezbollah engaged. And I recall on this program talking about the first battle where that became the case and said this is the end of this war as we know it. It will be entirely different now. And it has been. Vastly more savage. Vastly more cruel. With great atrocities now perpetrated on both sides. So a fundamentalist Shia Muslims and fundamentalist Sunni Muslims in a battle to the death. It changed everything as it relates to this proxy war. Now, Hezbollah is just called hardened fighters. They weren't hardened fighters. They didn't have any more experience fighting than did Assad's uh, army. Why they would call them hardened fighters is absurd. They're fundamentalists but so are the Sunni Muslims battling them. The article says, lives lost, lives forever scarred, a population that hardly recognizes its homeland, or in many cases even itself, thrown into the midst of unimaginable violence and adapting to survive. This is a proxy war against two, the two sects of Islam. Islam is divided between Sunnis and Shias. This is a battle between the two of them. There is nothing here but Islam. Islam is why these lives have been lost. Islam is why lives have been forever scarred. Islam is the reason this population cannot even recognize its homeland, and it's nothing but a heap of rubble. This is exactly what the 17th chapter of Yasaya reveals happens to Syria and to its cities like Damascus. The last line here is telling. The question is, is this a way to live? One man questions. If we were animals, the world would have more compassion. They are animals. Islam has made them so. There is no way to show compassion. Not in the midst of Islam. No matter how much compassion one were to attempt to show, all you would do is make the situation worse. You can't send food because the food will be used as a weapon by one side or the other. You can't send in weapons because that only makes the war more deadly. You can't do anything in this case except expose and condemn Islam, which is the one thing the world is not doing. Islam is not a way to live. It is only a way to die. We're witnessing that in Syria, which is why Yahweh picks Syria as the catalyst 
for the tribulation as the means that man deploys to savage his fellow human beings. Ignorant of Islam, we find this story. It is uh, about the uh, FBI and CIA releasing a highly redacted report on their failures regarding the Boston Marathon bombing, where Tamerlane Shinarev and his brother Jokar deliberately planned to mutilate and to murder innocent individuals in the name of Allah, in the name of Islam. And yet the extraordinarily expensive, extraordinarily repressive, extraordinarily dishonest institutions that are tasked with the protection of Americans, allegedly, the FBI and the CIA, had all of the reason in the world to know that these two boys were up to no good and that this was their intent, and yet they bungled the job. We should care about that. The reason they bungled the job is because they have been indoctrinated to do so. In the CIA and in the FBI, based upon what was done by the Bush administration and what has subsequently been done by the Obama administration. It is a career move for anyone in the CIA or FBI to associate terrorism with Islam. They are not allowed to eavesdrop upon, to spy upon, any Islamic religious establishment, including the mosques, where these terrorists are bred. They're not able to make a correlation between being a fundamentalist, devout Muslim, and the likelihood of promoting a terrorist act. What is astonishing about that, ladies and gentlemen, is that 99.9% .9 of terrorist acts in today's world are perpetrated by fundamentalist Muslims. And yet the CIA, nor the FBI, is willing to even consider Islam as a motivation. And so American citizens were murdered and they were mutilated as a direct result of the stupidity of the CIA and FBI. This is how the article that reads uh, regarding the failures of the FBI and CIA. They don't tell you the truth. There's nothing in them that's particularly useful, but at least a summation of them might be uh, helpful uh, to underscore the point I was making. Officials across multiple federal agencies failed to take steps to investigate warning signs they had received since 2011 about Boston Marathon bomber Tamerlane uh, Shinarev. The intelligence agencies and inspectors general report revealed on Tuesday the findings released in an unclassified summary, a highly redacted uh, uh, version of the classified report. You see, Americans, even when Americans are killed, even when the FBI and CIA fail, Americans are no longer entitled to information. Most of the report was classified. It highlighted instances where uh, information sharing among the 17 federal agencies uh, required in the Shinarev case and where the may have been more village, uh, vigilant in its investigation before the 2013 attack where three were killed and uh, over 200 were injured. Yeah, it just may have been more diligent. It is absurd what they missed. One example cited uh, is that the FBI legal attache in Moscow did not coordinate with the CIA after it received information about uh, Shinarev uh, from the Russian government in March of 2011. The Russians informed the FBI that Shinarev and his brother practiced, uh, this is radical Islam, they practiced fundamentalist Islam, and that Tamerlane Shinarev was planning to travel to Russia to join underground uh, groups in Kyrgyzstan uh, and Chechnya. Huh. That ought to have been sufficient. The Russians know. 
They do a better job of this than America does. And here's the Ameri the Russians helping the United States, even though the United States wants to rub their nose into Crimea. After investigating this information, the report states the FBI closed its probe on Shinarev because the agency found no links between him and terrorism because they will not consider Islam. That's the reason. Yeah, he was a fundamentalist Muslim, so what? So he hung with fundamentalist Islamic groups, so what? They can't make the connection. And they can't make the connection because it's a career move for any of them. If any of them says that the motivation for 99% of terrorist acts today, which is true, is Islam, and it's fundamentalist Islam, and Mohammed was a terrorist, and they're following Mohammed's example, and they're not corrupting their religion, it's their religion that is corrupting them, they will lose their job. It's as simple as that. They're ordered not to do so. After investigation, the FBI simply closed its probe. To determine uh, this, an FBI special agent interviewed uh, Shinarev and his parents and conducted drive-bys of his home and received references to him and other uh, counterterrorism cases. However, the Department of Justice Inspector General notes that the agent did not use several investigative tackle, uh, tactics, including contacting, contacting local law enforcement about Shinarev or speaking with his wife. He also never interviewed the girlfriend. Shanarev had been arrested for assaulting in 2009. Here you're told this person is a fundamentalist Muslim in direct contact with and meeting with Islamic terrorist organizations. He has a website devoted to fundamentalist Islam and promoting Islamic terrorism. He has been arrested for beating and assaulting his wife and girlfriend, and you don't even bother to follow up. The Russians subsequently provided uh, more information to the CIA in September. That was also ignored. Why? Because the FBI, the CIA, is unwilling to consider Islam as the cause of terrorism. The report even says that although U.S. Customs and Border Patrol agents noted that Shanarev had been placed on the watch list, the Russian trip did not result in any additional vetting at the airport. He was never even stopped or questioned on the, the airport, and yet he's on the watch list of known Muslim fundamentalists in association with Islamic terrorist organizations. Never bothered even to question him. Which is why, in fact, I read an article uh, posted by the uh, Washington Post about uh, three or four weeks ago. And uh, the conclusion of the article is that with all of the inconvenience opposed on Americans at airport screening, there's not a single speck of evidence to suggest that any of it has done any good. Why? Because America doesn't profile. It's that simple. And if you don't profile, you're not being discerning. If you're not willing to be judgmental, there is no purpose in doing it. All of the inconvenience, every American on a flight wasting two hours of their lives, being searched without reason, has produced absolutely no positive result. What? not relevant to the story that we're telling. It's still a uh, heart bleeds for the situation that occurred on Interstate 5 in um, Northern California. Uh, I believe it occurred uh, this morning uh, very early. Uh, there were students from Los Angeles uh, area, uh, high school students, I, I believe, that were traveling uh, north, um, and they were struck by a FedEx um, semi-truck uh, trailer. Uh, heading south, the uh, FedEx uh, trailer, uh, cabin trailer, uh, crossed the median uh, divider, which in that area was just grass, and uh, and then uh, went headlong into the uh, the bus, which means either the, the FedEx driver was trying to avoid someone that pulled into their lane, but you know, what were they doing in the far left lane, uh, or 
they lost a front left tire and lost control for that reason, or perhaps even fell asleep. Uh, hopefully that was not the case. But um, in this particular situation, nine people on the bus, the driver, three chaperones, and five students, and the FedEx driver were killed, and lots more uh, young people uh, have been uh, injured. Um, those are the kinds of things that happen every day, uh, and they are tragic, and they they are, however, quite different than the savagery that is being perpetrated in the name of Islam against women in Egypt and against uh, boys in Syria. Those things have a cause, a cause that we should condemn. We, there is no reason to uh, to go to war against uh, FedEx. Uh, no reason to condemn uh, trucks. Uh, no reason to condemn buses or high school students. Uh, it was a simple act of when you have vehicles of high occupancy or of considerable size traveling at high speeds, accidents are going to happen. They are unavoidable unavoidable. But it does remind me a little bit about the situation with the $6 billion award uh, uh, for punitive damages that was brought by a jury yesterday against a Japanese and American drug company. In that case, fewer people died than in this uh, truck incident. Now, in this incident, no one is going to be awarded $9 billion in punitive damages. <laughs> Not going to happen. But why, why uh, blame a drug that helps a lot of people for uh, the fact that there are consequences of all drugs and some people a uh, very small number, in fact fewer than those that died in this bus uh, accident, succumb to the negative effects. Just like FedEx does a lot of good in and transporting products around the country and around the world. Buses do a lot of good in taking people from one place to another. But there is a, a downside. They, there is a risk associated with them. Should we, therefore, just apply the same standard towards drugs? They help a lot of people, but there is a risk associated with them. And for a jury to award a a huge penalty to the uh, drug supplier is absurd, just as it is in the case of the, uh, the FedEx truck driver. There always are consequences. I want to use the, some of the time we have remaining to talk about what begins um, this Sunday evening. And since it will be uh, an event that we will be celebrating all of next week, most of my comments about this invitation to meet with God will take place um, next week. And I want to acknowledge the very fine work that uh, James and his wife Patty did in the presentation of Pesach, which is Passover, Matzah, which is unyeasted bread, and Bakorum, which is firstborn children. And they did so several weeks ago. And there's no reason to go into depth in a presentation of Pesach and Matzah because they devoted um, six hours to those two special days. But I think a little summary, a brief synopsis, if you will, some heartfelt insights into what these days represent is important since for those who look to Yahweh to come to know him, who choose to love him, who choose to invest the time to understand what he is offering in his covenant and who act upon it, for those who answer his invitations to meet, these are three of the most important days each year on our calendar and his. So I'd like to share a little bit about what they represent. The first thing I want to communicate is that there is no law. Those of us who observe the Torah are vastly freer than those who do not. Hebrew does not have a word for obey. 
when you see obey and an English translation of a of a Bible, it is almost always stupidly replacing the Hebrew word for listen or hear, shama. Shama does not mean obey. It means to listen. There is no Hebrew word for obey. God is not establishing a bunch of rules which you have to obey. He is instead providing guidance, as loving fathers do. He's providing teaching. He's providing instruction. And we today are free to disregard it or to accept it, to do as Christians do and to hate it or to love it. Your choice. You can be in opposition to it, or you can be an advocate for it. God's guidance. You can be ignorant of it, or you can be knowledgeable. The choice is entirely yours. Yahweh has made his Torah the single most copied, the single most um, well-documented, the single best-known work of antiquity. The Torah, which is comprised of the first five or six books of Hebrew revelation, Barashit, which is means in the beginning, Shemoth, which means names, Kara, which means invitations to meet, uh, the book that is now numbers, but, but ought to have been in the wilderness, Ba Midbar, in the place where there was no word. And the Dabarim, which means words, and potentially Yahusha, which means Yahweh saves, comprises the foundation of Yahweh's instruction to us, which is why it's called Torah. Torah does not mean law. It means teaching, guidance. It means instruction and direction. And there is no book in, in antiquity that is as well documented as the Torah. Nothing anywhere close. Uh, remotely, I mean, in it, it's a distance in, uh, in huge gap, is uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey by uh, Homer. But even in, in the case of the Iliad and the Odyssey, which would be the, the second most um, prevalent document in ancient history, um, in terms of proving that it is an ancient text uh, chronicling ancient events, the numbers are in the range of a hundred to one. A hundred times more evidence than for the Torah in antiquity than uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Moreover, while there is just very slim lines of, uh, of truth in the uh, Iliad, and almost none in the Odyssey, most of it is a fictitious story to commemorate an actual historic event. In the case of the Torah, Every detail of it has been affirmed by archaeology. When Yahweh says, this is where something happened, this is who was the king at that time, this is the nature of that community, these are the people that were there, this is what the, the town or city looked like, we found it where he said it was, when he said it was, the way he said it was. There is no ancient source of human history that is as precise, as detailed, as trustworthy, as dependable, as consistently correct as the Torah. Every time someone has tried to prove it wrong, that has blown up in their faces. A great example, Penn and Teller did a story about uh, the Exodus and said, you know, it never happened. There's no proof of Jews in Egypt. When, in fact, the opposite is true. Every aspect of that story in Goshen has been verified. They found the, 
the home of of Joseph. They found the the grave sites of the Israeli children who were killed there. They found the buildings that they were constructing, constructed of exactly the same material that Yah said they were, when he said they were, found the cities that they were building. Every aspect of it has been confirmed. And then we have found all of the evidences of the Exodus, even the beach at Nueva, where the Israelites were, were encamped for a moment between the mountains that they had to pass through, which now the Egyptians' military were coming after them, and the Red Sea, which they crossed at the Gulf of Aqaba. Found even a land bridge that would get them across with the waters parted. Even found chariot wheels of those Egyptians drowned once the Israelites got to the other side. Even a column erected by Solomon commemorating the great miracle that Yahweh performed at that site. Even Mount Horeb where they met, the charred mountain still charred where Yahweh's fire burned. The place where the water gushed out of the rock. The place where the Israelites foolishly built the altar to the sun god, Baal. It's all there, all confirmed. Welcome back to Shattering Mist. Some of you may be wondering, why would I go into this dissertation, of which I have not yet completed, on the Torah, if the purpose of this was to share a perspective on how to properly observe the three invitations to meet with Yahweh that began this Sunday evening at sunset, Pesach, Matzah, and Bakurim, Passover, on Easter bread and firstborn children. Well, the reason is there's only one place that these invitations are offered. There's only one context that they are presented. There's only one individual that informs us about them. And that's Yahweh and his Torah. If the Torah is valid, then these invitations, according to its author, are the means to salvation. They're the means to engage in a relationship with God. If the Torah is valid, there is no other way to engage in a relationship with God, no other way to be saved by him. If we can rely on the Torah, if it in fact is inspired, then those who do not answer these invitations and meet with God on these days have no hope whatsoever of ever knowing God, of ever engaging in any relationship with him, or ever being saved by him. They are excluded from salvation. If in fact this Torah that we're talking about was authored by God, whose name is Yahweh, then it not only provides the only means to know who he is, the only place where the offer is made, where the invitation is presented, but beyond that, these invitations are absolutely, unequivocally, undeniably associated with the one and only covenant. It means that there cannot be a New Testament, that there cannot be a gospel of grace, that there cannot be a Christian religion. If the Torah is true, Christianity is not. If the Torah is true, there has never been a single Christian saved, nor a Muslim, nor a socialist, secular humanist. Not one, ever, because the Torah is unequivocal. So let's return to the Torah. Is it credible? The Torah is the only place where there is a credible creation account. And we should give God some credit here, because prior to about 70 years ago, no one in the scientific community thought that the universe was created. 
None of them. Every scientist of any acclaim wrote that the universe always existed. That's why Einstein came up with his cosmological constant. The universe had always existed. It was repulsive, to quote scientists of the day, to even suggest that the universe was created. So science and God were on opposite ends. They had the opposite view. God was right. Scientists were wrong. That's what's so astonishing about pitting Big Bang against uh, the creation account and saying that one is scientific and true and the other is false. When you go back 70 years ago, there wasn't any scientist that advocated creation. And now they all do. In other words, they've admitted that they were wrong and that God was right all along. As for Big Bang, yeah, was Barashit in the beginning account uses the term Big Bang. Yahweh was the first to conceive it. He said that the universe began with the Big Bang. Every aspect of the creation account is accurate. Right down to the timing. Now, that's something that we really wouldn't understand until Einstein. When Einstein explained the nature of time and the relationship between time and light. Until that period... God knew and explained how long it took to conceive the universe, to author life, to make it hospitable for humankind, as a witness to the events, as six 24-hour days, which is exactly as long as it took. That just happens to be between 14 and 15 billion years using time as it flows here on Earth today. But relativity demonstrates that those two numbers are exactly the same. The radiation that still emanates from the Big Bang shows that time has been stretched to 10 to the 12th power. Do the math. Six 24-hour days is how long it took to create the universe based on the scientific evidence if you were at creation.